All right. Question. How big was the biggest spider that ever lived? We know there used to be giant bugs in the world, particularly back in the Carboniferous period, so the idea of giant bugs is not unique to the world of fiction. But I think spiders really take this question to a different level. Arachnophobia is frequently cited as one of the most common phobias in the world, and as a result, spider sizes have been sensationalized in media to take advantage of people's fears. I was personally shocked when I looked up giant spider movies and found that the list was virtually endless. Are any of them good? I don't know. Probably not. Maybe I'll have to explore that subject one day, but for now, we're sticking to real-world evidence, not fiction. Let's talk about the Carboniferous period real quick. The Carboniferous is a geological time period that spanned from 359 million years ago to 299 million years ago. This period was characterized by having an abundance of both plant and animal life living on land, which had not been a consistent factor up until that point. All right, but what does that have to do with bugs? Well, first, I'll note that I'm using the word bug loosely here to refer to any land-dwelling arthropod. Some of the largest bugs of all time were discovered from fossils to have lived during the Carboniferous period. To find out why, we should first talk about why bugs are so small today in the first place. Let's look at their bodies. Arthropods have exoskeletons. That's a tough outer layer of their body that can be incredibly sturdy in some animals. But the problem, of course, is that they have to shed or molt these exoskeletons every time they need to grow. This can get quite risky as an arthropod gets bigger and bigger, since that's more surface area that needs to mold correctly, so that they don't get stuck and die. That's a really cost-ineffective way of attempting to reach the same sizes that some vertebrates do. Why is it we can grow way bigger than bugs? Well, a huge factor is how we get our oxygen. Mammals and reptiles are two vertebrate lineages that have reached ridiculous sizes on land. Both breathe by taking air into a powerful set of organs called the lungs, which filter out non-oxygen gases and then feed the oxygen to the circulatory system. This is a really efficient way at making sure oxygen can travel through a large body. Insects, spiders, and other arthropods don't have true lungs. Instead, they either breathe through book lungs, an open circulatory system, or a combination of both. These methods are really efficient for small animals because oxygen can diffuse directly into the right body parts without the need for lungs. But it gets much harder to get enough oxygen if an animal's body is too big. The oxygen intake levels will simply not be enough. In order for a land-dwelling arthropod to get enough oxygen to grow as large as us, it would either need to evolve lungs or live in a place where oxygen is a larger percentage of the total gases in the atmosphere. This brings us back to the Carboniferous period. Not only did the Carboniferous contain some of the highest oxygen levels in the atmosphere compared to other time periods, but it was also the time where some of the largest arthropods of all time could be found alive. Among them was the largest land-dwelling arthropod ever discovered. Its name is Arthropleura, and it's an extinct genus of giant millipede. Arthropleura could grow to at least two meters, or six and a half feet, and it's speculated that its full length was closer to two and a half meters, or just over eight feet. Now, Meganeura was a genus of insect of the same lineage as modern dragonflies and damselflies. Its wingspan could grow as large as 75 centimeters, or two and a half feet. That's as long as the wingspan of some modern day birds of prey. This giant flying insect also lived during the late Carboniferous period. Then there's a giant from the arachnid class, like spiders, a giant scorpion called Pulmonoscorpius. Fossils of this ancient scorpion have been measured at lengths of over 70 centimeters, or 28 inches. It could also be found around the mid-Carboniferous period. With all these giant bugs roaming around, we have to have found traces of giant spiders at some point, right? Well, actually, yes. Enter Megarachne. Megarachne cervini was a spider relative discovered in 1980 in Argentina. Its genus name literally translates to great spider, which is fitting considering it was the biggest spider ever discovered at the time. Megarachne's leg span was estimated to be around 50 centimeters or 20 inches, which is an impressive 75% bigger than the largest spider found today, the Goliath bird eater Theraphosa blondi. Paleontologist Mario Hunikin used X-ray microtomography on the fossilized remains to extrapolate what the specimen would have looked like. This model quickly gained popularity because, as we discussed earlier, people love the idea of a giant spider. 
models of Megarachne were added to museums all over the world. But the public's notable interest in giant spider fossils might have done more harm than good in this case, since it caused many media sources to run with the idea of Megarachne as a giant spider before scientists around the world even agreed that the specimen was truly a spider in the first place. Even Hunikin himself had acknowledged that there were inconsistencies in the specimen's features when compared to other spider relatives. All of that fame would come crashing down in 2005 when a second, more complete specimen would be found and analyzed. It painted a very clear picture. Megarachne had never existed. At least not in the way the media had been portraying it throughout the last few decades. Megarachne, the great spider, was revealed to be a different chalicerate called a eurypterid. In other words, it was a sea scorpion. While its size was still impressive, sea scorpions had already been known to reach incredible sizes, much larger than Megarachne, so the size impact was lessened to a considerable degree. To make matters worse, it wasn't a spider, so the giant spider dream was seemingly dead. This brings us to modern times. With all of the paleontological and genetic discoveries we've made throughout the decades, the current winner of the largest spider ever discovered is Therophosa blondii, a species of goliath bird eater found in the Amazon rainforest in present day. So the question becomes this, is T. blondii the biggest spider that ever lived, or is the biggest spider that ever lived simply missing from the fossil record? This next part is going to be speculation, since we may not have access to all the data that would answer this question. I've spent a long time thinking about this, and I've come to the following conclusion. Therophosa blondi is likely the largest spider that's ever lived. If not, the title holder probably wasn't much bigger. I know, it's not the most exciting answer, but I'll explain why this is the more reasonable possibility. It all starts with another miscalculation. Earlier, we talked about the atmospheric oxygen levels in the Carboniferous period, right? Well, these oxygen levels are what you'll hear cited as the reason for giant bugs, if you watch older documentaries or read articles on the subject. But recently, opinions have started to change. Some of you may have wondered how we even know what oxygen levels looked like back then. Well, believe it or not, there are actually a lot of different indicators we can use to estimate oxygen levels of previous geological time periods. The problem is they're all only accurate to a certain degree, and they often conflict with each other. So new studies are constantly being published that give different estimates of what the atmosphere looked like in prehistoric times. Some of the newer models have shown that while oxygen levels were indeed high in the Carboniferous period, they fluctuated quite a bit, and only peaked near the end of the Carboniferous period, before possibly rising higher in the Permian and then falling in the Triassic. This is important because it creates inconsistencies in what had been hypothesized about bug sizes. Arthur Pleura was already enormous by the mid-Carboniferous, before current atmospheric measurement models show that oxygen levels rose to higher than present day. Well, if oxygen had nothing to do with Arthur Pleura's size, then what did? The real answer might have been simpler all along. The giant bugs of the Carboniferous may have simply been filling new ecological niches. See, the Carboniferous was the first period that saw both plant and animal life flourish on land. That meant there were new ecosystems that needed roles to be filled. A predator at the top of the food chain, several herbivores to take advantage of the various plants, decomposers to break down decaying matter, and even megafauna that could simply outgrow its competition. Since arthropods transition to land life faster than other phyla, they were able to adapt into these roles first. Sure, there are some animals that have since blown them out of the water, particularly in the megafauna department, but back then, there was no competition. Now, this theory is actually further supported when we analyze meganeura. If oxygen was really the factor to their great size, then we should have seen a reduction in flying insect sizes by the Triassic period at the latest. But instead, the ancient dragonfly relatives remained much bigger than present-day species until the mid to late Jurassic period. That's around 200 million years worth of giant dragonflies. The oxygen levels would have fluctuated significantly in that time frame. Instead, the shrinking of flying insect sizes appears consistent with another event in the history of evolution. That is, the divergence of theropod dinosaurs into birds. 
Once again, it appears it wasn't oxygen that contributed to giant bug sizes, but lack of competition in ecological niches. Meganeura was the only large predator in the sky for millions of years. Once insectivorous birds entered the world, however, it was no longer feasible for insects to compete for the same sizes. So they shrunk and adapted to more specific niches. Even scorpions, who at first glance seem relatively unchanged after all this time, still show signs of once having played a different ecological role. Ancient giant scorpions, like Pulmonoscorpius, had compound eyes, like modern dragonflies, butterflies, and mantises. Scorpions nowadays only have simple eyes with poor vision. This implies that the lineage once included powerful active visual predators, but the only members that survived hundreds of millions of years into the future were those that hunted smaller prey at night or in caves or rock crevices. Well, finally, this brings us back to spiders. If you're still holding out hope for a gigantic prehistoric spider, you might be thinking, maybe spiders could have followed the same evolution as scorpions. That is, they were giant in the Carboniferous, but got smaller as they were pushed out of their original ecological roles. Well, maybe, but I think it's far more likely that the opposite happened. We can find examples of scorpions as far back as 430 million years ago. Scorpions have been around for longer than all other large modern arachnids, and for millions of years they seem to be the pinnacle of the class Arachnida, the golden child, the ultimate specimen. But somewhere along the line, the script got flipped, and the king was dethroned. If we ignore the existence of spiders for a moment, arachnids aren't a very formidable group of animals. Not in the present day, at least. I, for one, almost never see scorpions and I bet many of you watching this video don't either. In fact, I'm willing to bet several of you may have never even seen a scorpion in the wild before. We could say the same goes for rarer arachnids like whip spiders, camel spiders, and vinegaroons. But I'll tell you what, I would be absolutely shocked to hear someone say that they haven't seen a spider in several months. I don't care where you live, spiders are as ever-present in life as birds, ants, or flies. You literally cannot avoid them if you try. But how did we get here? How did spiders become so prevalent? Spider fossils were scarce in the Paleozoic periods, but they show up with great diversity in the mid to late Mesozoic. I believe their success never actually came from their size, because spider lineages didn't truly take off until long after arthropod gigantism had already died out, especially on land. The success, diversification, and radiation of spiders was instead likely due to the even greater success of their main source of food, the insects. While it's true insects may have lost some size in the Mesozoic, they did not lose any pace in their evolution. For example, the Carnian pluvial episode of the mid-Triassic period saw the rise of the Dipterans, or true flies, one of the most dominant flying lineages of all time. It's likely thanks to this that the orb weaver spiders can be found as far back as the Jurassic period, given their main source of food was already around. But that was nothing compared to what happened in the Cretaceous period. The angiosperm revolution changed the way the planet looked and was arguably the most important moment in animal history since the Cambrian explosion. The relationship between flowering plants and pollinating insects became the dominant base of almost all ecosystems over the span of just a few million years. This not only blew up the population of flowering plants, but also that of insects, which had already been doing quite well, mind you. We are currently living in the aftermath of the angiosperm revolution. As a result, almost 80% of all plant species are flowering plants, and almost 80% of all animal species are insects. We can see from the fossil record that some of the most powerful insect lineages grew exponentially during the Cretaceous period, even some lineages like Hemiptera that are not primarily pollinators. We could say this, yet again, opened up new ecological niches. Whereas before, it was a pretty good evolutionary strategy to prey upon insects, well after the angiosperm revolution, it became the best evolutionary strategy in the world. Aside from just being an insect yourself, that is. Well, spiders were perfectly positioned among arachnids to take the spot of the top insect hunter, thanks to the versatility of their main superpower, spider silk. It allowed spiders to diversify in many ways and prey upon insects in the sky, in the water, on the ground, the trees, etc. But let me get back to the main point here before I ramble on too long about how cool spiders are. 
Although the Carboniferous period is famous for having giant bugs, there hasn't really been a large diversity of giant bugs found. Sure, we have giant dragonfly relatives, giant millipedes, giant scorpions, and large flying insects called dictyopterans, but the list tends to stop there. It isn't the case that every bug we find today had a giant equivalent in the Paleozoic era, it was really just the most powerful and successful lineages at the time filling key ecological roles in the absence of vertebrate competition. Spiders were simply not among the top arthropod lineages back then. Spiders don't truly show up in the fossil record in great numbers until the late Mesozoic period, likely due in part to the radiation of insects. Because of this, there isn't a good reason to expect that spiders were ever bigger in some time periods than others, and therefore, no reason to expect spiders have ever grown much bigger than the modern-day goliath bird eaters, not until proven otherwise. Alright everyone, that's going to wrap up the topic for today. I had a lot of fun with this one. It was a great combination of research of proven facts and hypothesizing missing information. It's also important to remember that when it comes to biology, several logical sound ideas have come to be disproved over time, so you don't have to give up hope for giant spiders just yet. As always, if you enjoyed the video, be sure to leave a like, as it helps a lot. You've been watching Arachnorion. This is Daniel Orion, signing off. I will catch you all in the next video.